G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. As the trade period looms and all the, the trade rumors are starting to hot up, over the last few weeks, I've made a handful of team-focused videos and I wanna continue that series. Um, I'm gonna make a playlist, which you should be able to click in the top right corner of this video, of all the teams I've done so far, and I intend to keep working through them and I'm not really doing them in any particular order. I'm gonna start with the, the teams I actually have some, something to say about. So I thought this would be an interesting time to discuss North Melbourne's off season, because it could be a very impactful one around the trajectory of their club. Obviously been a team that's been rebuilding for a number of years now, um, haven't seen a lot of success on field. And while there is a lot of optimism around you know, some of the young talent, I'd say this is the strongest batch of young star talent that North has accrued all at one time, this entire rebuild. And I don't know how far you wanna go back. 2019 was it? Perhaps 2020, I think they've been in the bottom four since then. And I think there's a lot of reason to believe that this time it will be different. As I said, first of all, that the young talent they've got there is the strongest and most proven batch of young talent, I would suggest, that they've had throughout this entire period. There's the Clarkson factor, but further to that as well, I would suggest that even on field, I think it's starting to take shape a lot better than it has uh, over any of the last four seasons that I've been observing North Melbourne. Season 2024 went more or less how I did forecast it would go for North Melbourne. And is that dumb luck? Probably with ladder predictions, right? But my take was that they're just still a little bit too young to really win enough games to be able to move up the ladder meaningfully. However, from the eye test, I do think we saw something different from North Melbourne. I believe I had three wins off the top of my head. I don't think it was four. It was three wins this year. And you've, if you look at it on raw numbers, that hasn't improved since 2020. But but there was a pretty prolonged period through the middle patch of this year when North Melbourne pretty much week in, week out, were putting consistently improved performances. And you know, to contrast it, and I can't help but compare it to my own club, the Eagles, naturally they've been the two worst performed teams over the last stretch. West Coast won more games this year, but I think North Melbourne, perhaps there was an element of luck there where some of their best performances were tight losses against teams that played well that day. Well, specifically, I'm thinking of Collingwood. They got close to beating Melbourne. I think Melbourne fell away after that. But they got within three goals of the Western Bulldogs. They challenged Carlton. That was when Carlton were going all right to from memory. So my point there is without, you know, getting too nitty gritty about it, in a stark contrast to previous seasons, I thought we saw North Melbourne put in a pretty extended run of more consistent form. That leads me to think now more so than ever, they're on the right trajectory. So again, considering how young this team is, I have done plenty of content about this. I don't want to harp on about that, but it is worth noting they were the youngest and least experienced team this year. That was their least average age going into the year, but also you can see the average age and experience of selected teams in 2024. So uh, North Melbourne, their average age this year was 24.3. The next two younger sides, just out of interest, were Gold Coast and Adelaide. Adelaide were far younger and less experienced than I perhaps realized throughout this year. And that is also true when it comes to experience. It's the same for average games of experience with 74.7 being North Melbourne, the least experienced selected 23 all season. Gold Coast and Adelaide were also the next two youngest in that stat as well, which is, as an aside, interesting. For a little bit of context, the oldest team in the competition, Collingwood, is more than three years older on average per player than North Melbourne in terms of selected teams this year. And with 54 average games experience more per player. So that's a picture of this year. You know, it was just the three wins, improved performances, a better, you know, level of consistency as well from North Melbourne, a more prolonged period of their best form. In 2023, they started the season red hot with two really impressive wins. And we started to think maybe, maybe this is the year for North Melbourne. And sure enough, it fell away. Well, that didn't happen in 2024. There was a slow start and a pretty bitter end, but that is to be expected somewhat with young teams. So with that laid out as the context, we got to talk about this trade period and they are linked to making some pretty serious moves in some cases for established quality players of all different types. We've got unappreciated talents, of, you know, out of favor at other clubs. We've got star talent, all Australians that could potentially move back to Victoria. We've got a couple of veterans who are more or less probably excess to requirements at their old club. And there's a couple of benefits to these moves. You know, they bolster their best 22, more established talent, but also they, they add some veterans, almost like transplanting genuine veterans to join their list. So if we look at, you know, the, the players that have left the club this year, these are the confirmed delisting. So the two oldest players on the list were Liam Shields and Hugh Greenwood. Both have retired. So with their links to Jack Darling and Luke Parker, to some extent, we're just transplanting new veterans onto that list. And there's obviously going to be a huge amount of benefit to that. It's worth considering are probably not going to have an immediate impact 
on field. Okay, maybe, you know, Luke Parker, for instance, bosses their midfield rotation a bit. He's still a pretty good player. He's not going to individually drive the team up the ladder. Same thing with Jack Darling. Okay, so there's a structural element there where he takes some heat off Nick Larky, but it's probably more off field the benefits that they're likely to get. But, you know, potentially a Dan Houston comes in and immediately makes that team a lot better. Now, the Dan Houston one is, is iffy. They're certainly in the hunt for Dan Houston. They've offered up a future first round draft pick for him. We don't know to what extent he that is likely to turn Dan Houston's head. We know it will get Port Adelaide's interest. They need to convince Dan Houston, and that's still possible. But I suppose in this video, we can probably you know speculate a little bit as to how much damage or how much impact could North Melbourne make on this trade period. As for their other list cuts, okay, so Taron Thomas obviously happened, uh, I think that was at the start of 2024, wasn't it? And much was said about that for, you know, the right reasons. Obviously, there was a lot of discussion around that because of the nature of what he was sacked for. Uh, one thing that fell to the wayside a little bit is, and it's probably less important, is the fact that Taron Thomas is actually a was a very good player and probably an important part of North Melbourne's best 22. So it's worth considering that in this analysis. They've lost a potential A-grade talent there right in the age bracket that would help them. So there's a little bit of adversity there too. Other than that, we saw Curtis Taylor, Biggie Nuon, Tyler Sellers, and Hamish Freed delisted. I don't know if that list is going to grow. So let's talk about some of the players that are linked to moves to North Melbourne. So we just talked about Dan Houston. Is it even 50-50? I'm not too sure at this current point in time. Um, like I said, you know, you can see the temptation for Dan Houston at 27 years of age to join a team that's already in the finals picture. But we can have a look at what their best 22 could look like if they get someone like a Dan Houston. Luke Parker and Jack Darling we know about. Recently, I, I made a video yesterday about news that they are interested in Caleb Daniel from the Western Bulldogs. Matt Owies, they've also had a bit of a sniff at, and that one makes sense considering, you know, a genuine small who can attack the goal face and just kick goals is probably something they can add to their best 22 as well. I've seen a little bit about Dylan Williams, Dane Rampy, and Tim Membry, um, but those are just kind of like whispers online and I haven't seen anything concrete. Oh, forgive me. I have to take off my jumper. It's getting hot. I get like this when I talk about trades. Okay, so the next part I want to do is probably... Have a look at some mock trades, how North Melbourne can get a number of these targets onto their list. And then we're going to map out what their 22 could look like and, and have a little bit of a look at the distribution of age and experience as well. So first of all, Jack Darling for pick 64 is probably the one you can just about lock in. We've seen that reported in several places now, and it seems to be 64 for Jack Darling. So let's get that done. What would Luke Parker cost in a trade? Probably similar. Should we just say his future fourth round pick? I mean, I'd, I don't think Sydney are going to put up too much of a fight for that one. Now we'll take a best case scenario with this mock trade and let's suggest that Dan Houston does decide to come join North Melbourne. Let's say future first round selection is enough to get Dan Houston and we'll, we'll look at the best 22 in a moment. And Matt Owies as well. Matt Owies has apparently met with a number of interstate clubs. I, I've seen some suggestion that North Melbourne are interested. They're not necessarily, you know, like a leading contender for him. However, in my personal opinion, I can see them being a serious contender if they decide to really pursue Matt Owies because whatever way you slice it, surely a Victorian team is going to have an advantage over Brisbane, West Coast, Gold Coast, Port Adelaide. Those are the teams that have been reportedly meeting with Matt Owies. I'd like to see North Melbourne pursue this. And what, what would it cost? I don't know, pick 22? Kick 30-odd goals this year as a small forward. He is going to be 28 by round one of next year. I think 22 probably gets it done. Again, North fans might have a different opinion about using pick 22 on a Matt Owies, and I could see the argument for that because I still think they need to add tools in this year's draft, which we will talk about as well. But on value, what's North Melbourne's next pick, pick 40? That's probably not going to get it done for Matt Owies. So let's just say they do an equitable trade for Matt Owies, and then they can decide to offer a token pick for Caleb Daniel. Now, Caleb Daniel probably won't cost much. He's contract for another couple of years, but I think when a team like the Western Bulldogs more or less signals that he should probably move on and he's not really a part of their plans, then I think that signals a potentially cheap trade. So do they go for Caleb Daniel if they get Dan Houston? The need probably dries up. So you're probably talking about one of Caleb Daniel or Dan Houston. So you can probably substitute one for the other in terms of like mapping out their best 22. Caleb Daniel could be for like pick 58 as well. Then, you know, again, this isn't probably the main part of this analysis, but I do think North Melbourne could and should explore the possibility of trading pick two down in this year's draft. You know, someone like a Richmond could hold picks, let's say six and 21. Would, would you do that as a North Melbourne fan, considering the evenness and talent between two and six? A desire to probably pick some tolls in this year's draft, you know, looking at their best 22, which I'll get up in a second. I don't know if spending pick two 
on the best available midfielder is really a high priority for North Melbourne when you could say get six and 21. And you know, at six, you know, you'd probably be looking at guys like either Luke Trainer, who seems to be falling down the order a little bit, or Harry Armstrong. At this stage, the best tall forward and the best tall defender in this upcoming draft, you'd probably get access to one of those. And then further down the list at 21, as it currently stands, there could be a number of good quality talls at both ends of the ground still available. You've got Alex Toru, he could still be available by then. Toomey seems to think that's probably not gonna happen. There's John T. Fall, there's the Whitlock twins, there's Noel Moraz. We don't need to get caught up in the specifics here. However, there is a, is a batch of tools still available there for North Melbourne. So that's probably what I would explore if I was North Melbourne. All right, so I've had a crack at mapping out a best 18 for North Melbourne here, and then a bunch of fringe players and a bench there that it becomes a little bit messy for me, not being a North Melbourne fan trying to get the best 22 absolutely accurate, considering there's probably a lot of evenly rated depth players that I just don't know. But I've had a crack. This is a bit of a fun look at what their best 22 to 30 players could look like next year. So I'll get it up on the screen here. I did this in a series last year. I've got their age by pretty much March 20. I can't remember when the season starts, but around then. The first number in brackets is their age. The second number there is how many games they've played at AFL level. So in green, I've inserted Dan Houston, Jack Darling, Matt Owies, and Luke Parker. You'd imagine all of those would be considered best 22. I don't think they'd bother trading for a Darling or a Parker if they intended to keep them in the VFL to start. So down back, you know, I've got Shees on the back line for now. Obviously, he played pretty much everywhere in season 2024, but there's also Combin, who I've read, you know, might play forward this year. Me, personally, mapping out their team, I found it a little bit easier to play Combin back. There's some other defenders, obviously. There's Aiden Kaur, who I, I've put on a bit of an extended bench here. Will Dawson, who's played three games. You know, I don't know to what extent he will be ready for regular time next year. Toby Pink's in this area as well. Again, I wouldn't get caught up too much in who I've selected there, but... I'll show you the extended bench here too. I've got Simkin on the bench, Fisher. Caleb Daniel in there is a maybe. Like I realize that if Houston comes over, Caleb Daniel probably becomes excess to requirements anyway. But perhaps, you know, he could be a best 25, 26 option if he comes over and he's, he's nearly played 200 games of footy as well. And I want to go through that more specifically. And there's just a bunch of players. I mean, Tom Powell, I've got on the bench. You know, he could easily start over Luke Parker. I realize that Eddie Ford, I'd imagine, gets games next year. Will Phillips, Josh Goder, I think he did his Achilles last year. He could come into the mix. He just played the 12 games. I'm not too sure what's happened with Bryn Tickle. And what I mean by that is I know he played this year and it helped structurally, but you know, do they go Darling, Larky and Tickle? I'm not too sure. They could. I'm genuinely unsure about that point. I think it could work. But I also wanted to go through a bit of a demographic breakdown of this team, right? So in their best 23-ish players, you've got three 200 gamers. And bearing in mind, like Liam Shields comes out, but you've got Luke McDonald, Parker and Darling. All these guys will be pretty short-term contributors, you'd think. Again, I know there's North fans out there who want McDonald out of the team, but for now, I think he's still the captain, isn't he? He'll be there. So you've got three of those. You have eight players between 100 and 199 games of experience. So one of Houston or Daniel. Bailey Scott's over 100 games now. LDU, Larky, Zerha, Simpkin, Fisher, and Core. It's actually building really nicely as a group of players in their prime. It just goes to show you what 12 months does um, to getting games into even guys who you know are not youngsters, but if they're around the 100 game mark now, specifically LDU, Zerha, Bailey Scott, those guys who are already still on the list. I feel like that group has solidified a little bit. Then there's a group of five players in this best 23 roughly who are between 50 and 99 games. That's Griffin Logue, Matt Owies, who I've you know obviously transplanted into this team. Paul Curtis, I think has shown some really good signs at AFL level. Uh, Tristan Cherry obviously had a fantastic season. He's a best 22 lock, obviously. And Tom Powell also had a bit of a breakout season. So let's talk about the, the seven players probably in their zero to 50 range that are under 50 games. And this is easily the strongest and most talented part of the list, if you didn't already know. So there's Harry Sheasel, George Wardlaw, Colby McKercher, Zane Dersma, Charlie Combin, Jackson Archer, who had a fantastic season, and Will Phillips, who is probably going to be around the team. I'm not 100% sure how that looks. So without going in there and, and calculating the mean average of, of all, all their ages, and I have to work out the months and the game's experience, I haven't done that. But I'm going to say, superficially, I'd be very confident that that age blend gets a whole lot better. And obviously this does rely on someone like a Dan Houston coming in. To what extent can they improve if they get Dan Houston? I look at that best 22 
there and that is with Dan Houston. And I don't think it's a million miles off finals anymore. On quality, it would rely on a few things. Obviously, Wardlaw, McKercher, and Dersma probably need to take a step. They're already good players, but you know, a, a, a quite obvious step to help, you know, that midfield depth. Darling's presence would need to really provide some relief for Nick Larky, which may or may not happen. Getting Griffin Logue for a full season this year would make a big difference. Harry Sheasel was already a gun. Jackson Archer has already become a very good player. LDU elevating himself to being the A grader that I know he can be is also a huge factor in there. So I'm not going to make the claim that North Melbourne are going to play finals. However, I, you know, I feel increasingly confident this will be the year that they bridge that gap between the fourth worst team and the third worst team. Over the last few years, there has been an undeniable gap between mostly North and West Coast, and now Richmond have come down to the little tea party we're having at the bottom of the ladder. But I think I think this will be the year, regardless of Dan Houston, if they get some of these guys of experience, but also just looking at some of these guys who are going to get to close to 50 games. Some guys are going to push over 100. Plenty of reason for optimism for North Melbourne going into this year, and I do hope that they do land a number of these targets. Darling and Parker seem pretty safe. Um, I'd like to see them get Owies. In an ideal scenario, they'll get Dan Houston. Again, I'm probably leaning towards that being Carlton. But I do think North Melbourne could potentially, you know, rattle some cages and make a splash this trade period. So North fans, let me know what you think. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.